right, next up we have Jeremy Shulman to talk about self-service network automation with, with Slack. As Jeremy gets set up, I try to point out oftentimes I talk to a lot, of, a lot of my clients about network automation. And the, the reality is if you deploy the best solution in the world, and if it's, if it's not used, no one wins. It's really a lose-lose for everyone involved. I think it's really important to consider who the main target consumer or customer is of the tool. Is it fellow network engineers? You know, is it other users in the organization? I think this next uh, this next session and demo you're about to see really kind of makes you think about you know how network automation can be consumed by other folks within the team. That's not you. All right. So my name is Jeremy Shulman. Uh, first, I'd like to thank um, Jason for having me. Um, I am new to being a customer. Um, I've been in the networking space for 20 years, and uh, oh, I got to figure out how to get my desktop. Get my desktop thing. So uh, I, my name is Jeremy Shulman, and I'm going to talk about Slack and what I've been doing with it. And, uh, and really, the goal here is to just kind of get you to think about, you know, what's kind of the art of the possible. Usually. I talk about programming and Python, and I get into the weeds of doing some very nerdy things. Um, this is not that kind of presentation. Um, if you want to learn Python or do anything that I'm showing you today, I'm happy to show you how I did everything I'm about to show you. Um, I'm very active, or I used to be, and I'm getting more active again into contributing back to the open source. So I'm going to show you a lot of demos. These demos, uh, actually, this is uh, recordings of our live system at Major League Baseball. So they are recordings because I don't want to do live demos on the Major League Baseball network because there are games going on. So I don't want to do that. Um, but I've been, in the, I've been in the vendor space for 20 years, and I've just recently switched over to being a customer. And, uh, and I can talk at length about, wow, things are different you know, from out in customer land. Uh, and I've learned quite a bit. Um, I am a dedicated software engineer in the networking engineering team, so I have a traditional group of network engineers, and I am their blacksmith. I like to think of myself as their blacksmith. And they're the warriors that need better weapons. Um, so I'm 100% I'm dedicated and focused on this. So uh, I like to talk about the why. You know, what's the motivation for using Slack? Why did, why did we use Slack? Um, I'm going to spend you know, maybe five or six slides going through this motivation because I think this really addresses a lot of the questions when people ask, you know, what should I do with network automation? How should I get started? What are the use cases? And for everybody who comes up and speaks, I think these journeys are all very personal. This is what makes sense for me at the company that I'm at. Um, so I'm going to talk about the motivations for using Slack uh, at the company I'm at. I'm going to go right into demos. I, you know, I'm a big fan of, you know, demo early, demo often, just to, to show you guys what it is that I'm talking about. If these things are very better shown than talked about. And then I'm going to talk about some lessons learned, uh, talk about how things were done, and, and I'm, then I'm going to happy to answer any questions you have. Um, I've been, like I said, I've been doing network automation exclusively for the last eight years. You know, I really got started back in 2012, and I tried to distill, you know, why is it that we're trying to do network automation? Um, and I've reduced it to kind of these three bullet points. So everything that I do, no matter what it is, kind of touches on these three aspects. It's, it's to reduce operational friction. And what I mean by that is reducing the amount of time from going from, aha, I need to do a thing to, you know, cha-ching, that thing is done. Whether that thing is for me, something that my team needs to do, or something that my organization needs to, to get done. You know, I need to deploy a new data center. I need to, you know, replace a switch. That's the aha to cha ching moment. And reducing the friction in that process is generally measured in, in the function of time. Like we always talk about reducing time. But it's also about re reducing, you know, the pain of the thing. How hard or how painful is it for me to do this thing? And, and a lot of times that's friction that's really hard to measure because it's kind of, you know, well, it's really hard for me to do something, it's very easy for somebody else to do something. Um, the second thing that I think is very, very important is building trust through reliability. So we, we talk about reliability as an engineering thing, like NRE and, and reliability, and then there's a lot of people in this room that are probably thinking, well, if I write code, and this is the first time I'm writing code, it's not going to be reliable, so how is this, how is this reliable? You know, how, how can I sell this as reliability to my company? 
Um, so anything that I do, I try to think about how is this going to build trust, not just with my team who is new to network automation, but the company, the other elements of the company that are relying on some of the, the tools that we're building. And then finally, um, I talk about improving the service experience. And, and again, this, this is slightly um, related to the friction thing, but it's also kind of different in the sense of, if I'm going to build a tool, how easy is it to use? And this is a big deal, uh, because you know something that I'm building for me to use, I can withstand some amount of, you know, it's not so easy to use, and it has weird options and command lines, but if I'm giving this tool to somebody that has no knowledge of networking or the networking concepts, but they want push button, get banana, you know, that's a different user experience. And so, these are things that you know I consider when I'm building tooling for not only myself, my teammates, or other people that are outside of my organization. So what we needed was a self-service portal, and and I think maybe I, I hope everybody understands what that concept means. It means that somebody who is not me can go to a place and and do a thing without asking you know for somebody else to do it for them, um, and in many cases. Uh, there are parts of a process that need to do something with a network. That is outside of networking. They just need to do something with a network. And uh, these become bottlenecks if they have to open up a ticket, ask somebody to do a thing, etc., etc. So there was a need for a self-service portal primarily driven by people outside of the network engineering team you know, people like say at a ballpark who has to, you know, bounce a port on a wireless access port because that's a thing that they do. You know, they don't want to have to open up a ticket, call somebody, slack somebody and say, hey, can you do this for me and wait. Because maybe waiting is a difference between making a phone call or not making a phone call and that's very important to them. So, you know, I look at network automation primarily not about how does it affect me, but how it affects everybody around me. Uh, and, and this is why people want a self-service portal. So, the common use cases that we have, uh, and I'm gonna go through these, I'll talk about a little bit about them a little bit, but I want you to see the pattern. I want you to look at this list and see the pattern, you know, the common thing that is pretty much the same in all of these use cases. The first one is, I wanna check to see if I have a, a user on my VPN and maybe I need to bounce them. So, you know, is Jeremy Shulman, you know, on the VPN and maybe he shouldn't be, so I wanna, you know, bounce him off. Um, you know, I want to know that I've got a wireless access client on my network or not, or what's the, the status of that person. Uh, I need to see if a switch interface is up, operational, is taking errors, you know, what's the status of this interface? Uh, maybe I need to bounce this up a port because I've got a weird access port or I'm, I'm moving a void phone or something. Uh, maybe I need to change a VLAN on a port because I'm moving my my VoIP phone from one port to another because the port gets bad and now I have to you know, assign the VLAN to that port. Uh, maybe I need to you know, query my IPAN, get some information about a host and see all the information about an IP address. Can anybody guess what all of these things have in common, except maybe one? They're all read-only, right? You know, people need information about the network, but they're not changing the network, the configurations, except in that one case where it's a VLAN configuration. So, you know, again, the, the primary motivation, my users are, are generally outside of the networking team, but they touch the network or they are detrimentally reliant on the network for something. And, and they need push button do network, right? They don't know the names of the interfaces on my switch. That's not what they see, that's not what they think. You know, they, they just need, I need to bounce this port that's connected to this thing. Um, so that's my primary user. So those are the people that we build and optimize the user experience around. Now I also have uh, you know, my team, the network engineers, who have to do more complicated tasks, like maybe troubleshoot multicast through our network. And that's a very hard problem if you've dealt with multicast or multi-vendor network, it's, it's a pain. But there are elements of that process where, you know, hey, show me on this, on this device if there's any error counters on these multicasts. You know, just, read one, one piece of step in the, a very complicated process and get me a quick answer on just that one step because maybe it's a five step process, but if we can optimize or give them a quick answer on this one step, it shortens the problem from a 20 minute thing to a five minute thing because that one step was the bulk of the work, was getting that, that data. 
So in those cases, their user experience, you know, they can understand things that are very network specific, you know, ports and interfaces and IP addresses and things of that nature. So I have to, I have to think about both of these types of users. So in my company, we use Slack. Uh, I don't know if Slack is, you know, something that everybody uses. I presume everybody knows what Slack is. But we, we operate as a distributed kind of, you know, company, even though most people are in New York, but we have ballparks and we have remote offices. But everybody is on Slack. We use Slack for everything, and uh, and there was a, a, because of this fact, you know, the, the, the question was, is, well, could we use Slack to be that front end? You know, why make another website? Why make another web portal? Why? You know, somebody brought up the thing. You know, if you build another tool and it's just somewhere else they need to log into, they'll forget and won't do it, etc. Everybody is always on Slack, so why not use Slack? Uh, and, and do it in a way that makes it a, uh, an intuitive user experience. Uh, the other thing that was really important about the Slack mechanism is that it's a shared interface, meaning if two or three people are in a, in a Slack channel and one person queries of data, everybody can see it, so if you're trying to troubleshoot a thing, it becomes a shared experience. And that's, that's a really uh, powerful medium to doing this type of uh, workflow. All right, so uh, it, I wanted it to be intuitive. So rather than um, you know, talk about these things, I'm going to show you a few demos. All right, so the blurring, again, I recorded this because this is, this is essentially live data um, off a network. So there are things I had to blur. I'll try to move this out. OK, so what you're looking at is our Slack channel, where I have this uh, command set up. Now, the way I've done this, uh, and this was an iteration, you know, we first started uh, working with Network to Code, who, who, who started down us on this path. And every command was its, it, or every workflow was its own command, uh, which is a good place to start, but that didn't really work for our environment because we have, you know, 10,000 employees and we don't want them all to see all the commands. We wanted to make one command, and so we made a command called net. And so what you'll see here is uh, I'll type in net. And what will pop up is a menu. Um, is it readable? Can you guys read that? Yep. OK. So basically, we wanted to make this intuitive. We wanted to be as much push button you know, as possible. So you know, it's basically saying, hey, you know, click something here and select a, a task that, that you want to do. And in this case, uh, this task was um, you know, check the user, uh, the VPN user. And you can see this is a dialog box, and it has a freeform piece of uh, text, so I can type in the username, and then I can click Submit. So uh, once I click Submit, what you'll see at the bottom here is it's, it's saying, hey, this was done. Uh, you could actually not click buttons. You could type in a full line of CL, quote, CLI command, and I'm going to get to that uh, in a minute. But you could kind of have this power user uh, mechanism. Now what's, what's happening is, is behind the scene, it's processing that information and it kicks off a, a playbook. Um, this happened pretty fast, actually. Uh, and I have some diagrams that I'll show you how this works, but it basically kicked off an Ansible playbook. The Ansible playbook read some information off of a device. It formatted it in a way that uh, made the information human readable, so I've kind of blocked out the fields that are all IP addresses and whatnot. And then there's a button that says, you know, what do you want to do now? Do you want to kick this guy off or not? And so in this case, I'm going to kick myself off. And then, you know, you can have these types of are you sure mechanisms inside of Slack. And uh, what's going to happen is that's actually kicking off another playbook that is going to kick me off the, the network. And it's always prompting me through this process. Now, you can see that I actually was kicked off the network because this is telling me I got kicked off the network. So that's a pretty cool uh, workflow there. So that's an example, that's one example of uh, a workflow that we, we set up. Now, uh, let's see. Oh, that's so good. All right, am I over the one yet? What's that? All right, so this is another use case uh, that I think is really cool. So one of the most common uh, things people want to do is get the state of, you know, port. So again, you know, here's a case where I'm going to say, give me the, uh, the state of a port. And what you'll see here is it's basically giving you information. You know, hey, this is what you can do. You can see the information that needs to get populated. You can see that it's color coded to indicate some kind of visual cue, like you're not done yet. And 
I optimize this again for the user experience of point and click. I, I want to remove, to the best of my ability, any freeform input. I don't want people to type in anything. Uh, and also, Slack is optimized for your, your mobile. So not only, I'm doing this on my laptop, but I could be doing this on my mobile. And mobile has you know characteristics of being on a mobile device. You want point and click. So here. Uh, So here, you know, it's basically saying, you know, this is what you need to do. So go start clicking things. And you'll see these are the ballparks. And as I'm clicking through the, the UI, new things start to show up. So again, present users only with the things that they need to do. And as I'm presenting that information, it'll say, these are the switches that are in this ballpark. And they're oriented around kind of their role. So we've got switches that are in the dugout. We've got clubhouse switches. Now, the, the presumption here is they're going to kind of orient around, I know which switch I want, and our switches happen to be labeled, so they're going to know what these, these host names mean. I don't want them to type them in, I want them to be you know, point and click, so I can orient this. Now, I'm not showing every single switch in my network, I'm only showing the ones that are for this particular ballpark. Now, uh, once I click one of those, I'm going to get another input. Now I can get the interfaces tab, so now I need to pick an interface. And again, what you're going to see here is I'm not seeing like Giggy 001 or blah, blah, blah. What they wanted to see was how they, the user at the operations people, view our switches. Simple, you know, port 1, port 2, etc. As well as have the uh, description uh, of that interface populated. So once I've provided all of the information, you can kind of see that the lights go green and now I have a submit button. So it's walking them through in this kind of very wizardy-like fashion. So now I'm going to click Submit. And for those people that you know, just don't want to click all the buttons, it says, OK, this is the command that you could have typed if you didn't want to click all the buttons. And so that's going to kick off a, a, an Ansible Tower job, and it's going to read the information off. And this is in real time. I did not slow this down. I did not cut out any time. You know, as the playbook is running, it's updating the user, you know, kind of what in programming we call the stroking user, so they know something's going on, and it provides back information. And now we're not, uh, we're not curating this information, we're giving it to them, as I would say, in the raw, uh, but another idea is to curate only and show them only the information that we think they should see, but this is an example of a point-and-click uh, workflow. All right, is there a three? Am I, show me, am I under three yet? Yep. Is that three, yeah. right here? Yep. Right. So this one is a variant of that theme. I just want to show you um, some other capabilities that you can do in, um, in a Slack user experience. It's the same use case, but what I want to show you is what happens if you want to go around and change certain, oh, oh this is. UI error. All right, so this is the UI area. I skipped one, I probably should because I'm gonna run out of time. So I wanted to show off that you, know, you can do error handling very well. Uh, in this particular case, uh, this is one that says, uh, give me a multicast IP address. And so if I were to type in something that wasn't an IP address, and I click do it, it's gonna tell me this is not an IP address. Uh, or I could put in an IP address, and it's gonna tell me uh, this is not a multicast. That's what that's saying. Um, or, you know, I can put in a multi, uh, multicast IP address, but maybe this isn't a multicast IP address that I know about in, from my source of truth. So again, that, the concept of having data in a source of truth and then using that information in workflow uh, is very critical. You know, I set a timer and then I forgot to start it. That's, that's <laughs> What, is, it, what's, is, it, what, is there another one down here? The CLI demo. Okay, we're going to skip the CLI demo. I'm going to go back to the slides because the, the CLI demo comes up in a minute. So, am I over the right one? All right, great. This is the first time this has ever happened to me. I've been presenting for like 15 years. This is like, I feel ridiculous. Okay. So how does this work? Now this is really kind of important because if you're, if you're going to attempt to build some of these things, uh, it's important to understand the architecture of how a Slack app works. Uh, you have your, your front end, which is either your desktop or your mobile. It talks to this cloud service, 
right? Slack, and then you have your application, your Slack app, that uh, is reachable from the cloud. That means you, there has to be an IP address, you know, or, or a DNS. It's got to be reachable from the cloud. You can write your code in, in any language. Uh, I happen to choose Python, but you can do it in any language. It just has to, you know, talk REST more or less. And then from there, you're going to talk to all these sources of truth that you have or your network. That becomes your back end. So this is how essentially the workflow uh, operates. You know, user in their client will click a button, do a thing. It goes up to Slack. That Slack, you know, represents that information back to your app. Your app has to handle that event. So every time I clicked a button or changed a thing, there were messages going back and forth between the app and uh, the user. So the way I've built this is a what is called a Slack app, where you interact by typing a slash command, and then the user is presented with either what are called those interactive messages, which you saw with the drop downs and whatnots, or and or with dialog boxes. Uh, there's a lot of widgets that are available. You know, there's those drop down menus, there's buttons, you can put in pictures, they can be clickable, you can do date time uh, picker, you can do uh, raw text input, you can do a text box, which is a multi line kind of input, and you can have clickable uh, browser links. Now, uh, somebody asked me, what's the difference between an app and, and a chat bot? Okay, a chat bot uh, is kind of what Darren was showing. I don't know if Darren's still in the room. Yep. It's kind of a chat bot where you hook in natural language processing or just it just takes in you know English and it responds to it in that way. Um, I think that's super cool. Um, that was you know something I might get to one day, but that's more of a chat bot experience where you're giving kind of this humanized experience or a, a, a language processing experience. One is used to build on top of the other. It's just what you're trying to build for your for your uh, user base. So this is again how, how this, this workflow uh, operates. The green dot here represents kind of the start of an action. So they initiate some kind of request. API messages go back and forth between the Slack app. Mine's called NetBot because I'm very creative. And eventually it's gonna call the Ansible Tower API to kick off a job, which means I've created an Ansible playbook and I'm running that playbook through Tower. Tower is great for this. Uh, because Tower gives me an API, Tower gives me RBAC, Tower gives me all of the you know, credential stores, Tower gives me all the things that allow me to uh, reliably execute uh, a playbook in these single units of a function. And those playbooks are, are given parameters so that they can respond back to the Slack channel for which the message was initiated. Now, does it have to do that? No. But that's what we chose to do. We have Ansible responding directly back into the channel. Ansible could have responded back into my net map. I could have curated the data into something different and presented that back into the, the channel. But this is a great way to get started. It's, it's, you know, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just what you want to do with it. Um, this is an example of that VPN uh, use case you saw me do. This is a multi-stage workflow where in the first stage I said, show me Jeremy as a VPN. It ran an Ansible playbook, it responded back, it queried the user for some new action, which is that triangle. It's like, hey, I need you to do something. It responded back, this, the netbot said, okay, I'm doing that. You know, it's in progress. It executed another playbook. And you can kind of repeat and rinse lather and repeat this kind of workflow. So you can build very sophisticated and complex workflows by just kind of stacking these types of operations together. Uh, this is a, a very interesting uh, workflow that uh, I was shown by uh, a colleague of mine, uh, but I personally haven't implemented yet. Uh, Damien and I have worked together uh, off and on, and uh, he actually was the first one who did a netbot demo when we were working at Abstra uh, together, which was, I was like, oh, that's kind of cool, but who's going to ever use that? This guy. All right, so this is a workflow where a user, let's say uh, somebody out in the field wants to do some task, but we don't want to let them do it and, you know, push button, do it. We want, we really want somebody to make sure it's okay for them to do it. So what happens is, is they initiate the request, NetBot then sends that request to another user in another channel, like say that goes into the network engineering channel, specific channel, and we authorize, we push the button, we say yeah, it's okay, or no, it's not okay. 
And then that would initiate the work to get done by, by Ansible, and then Ansible would respond back to the user. But all through this process, we're telling the user what's happening, how long it's going to take. We're always giving them that, that feedback. This is kind of a, an approval workflow process. Um, but we're network engineers, and we love our CLI, and I don't want to push button, you know, that, you know, everybody wants a GUI until they don't. You know, everybody wants a GUI until they want the CLI. And I've been through this uh, in many, many times. You can make the most glorious web UI, and it's, it's like four clicks. A network engineer is like, I do this all the time, just give me a CLI. So what, what I built into this is the ability to enter the CLI command, and then either get all the way done so that they can just click submit, or get halfway through the workflow and they can fill in the rest through, through the, the point and click. So again, allow me to demonstrate. I'm going to do this. All right, is this the one that says CLI? Yeah. This one says CLI? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, oops. Uh-oh. Am I over quit? <laughs> oh, that's reboot. <laughs> All right, let's just skip that. All right. This one right here? Awesome. This is audience participation. This is the, uh, the 11 o'clock show. The uh, 7 o'clock show can be much better. <laughs> All right, so in this case, um, what I'm doing here is I'm typing in dash dash help. Now, anybody who's uh, written Python and they've used args parse, this is that thing simply put into Slack. So I kind of rolled the, the args parse engine into the, the Slack library that I'm using. Uh, and so you can just do dash dash help, which is if I were on the command line, would do exactly the same thing. And this is showing me all the commands that I could do and the help that you would get with it. So I can, you know, I see these are all the commands that I had from my dropdown, and if I really wanted to show you that again, which I'm going to do, you can see that these are all the commands from that dropdown. And if you uh, mess around with args parse, you know, you can kind of drill into a specific command, so I can drill into a specific command and do help, and I can kind of do this ad nauseum. So somebody can really kind of explore the, the CLI, if you will, you know, to, to as much as they want. And once they know what the CLI is going to be, then they can you know, type in a very specific command. So in this case, I think we're going to do a, that get port status command. And, and yeah, the get port status command. And you can see like these are the options that you need to provide. And you can see there's special three letter codes that we have for our baseball parks that we need to show. You, know, you need to enter those in, so it does do kind of that kind of processing. And if you type something in that's not correct, you know, you get an error, and I can indicate that again with coloring. So, you know, when it's bad, show red, and then give them help. Uh, and all of this is built in through ArcSparks. You know, ArcSparks was the engine that, that did all this. I just kind of wired it into this library. And um, it, this is just showing you examples of, of parsing for error. Now, when you type in something that's good, which is what's going to happen next, it's going to get you as far as far in as we, we got. So somebody entered the three-letter code, so it already filled that in. They don't have to click that. And now they have to kind of fill in the rest. So it takes them as far into the process as, as they went. Now, they can kind of go and provide as much input as they want, and it will still kind of take you as far as you want to go. Uh, so in this case, you know, it, it provided that, and then at this point, I would you know, select the interface. So, so you can have both. It's not an either or. You can have both. People want both. I have different types of users. That's just you know the world I live in. All right. Let's see now. Can I get back to my PowerPoint? So this is lessons learned. Now, uh, every time I get up and I get to, to do a presentation, I always like to ask the audience, you know, how many of you are programmers? How are you network engineers? But I'm not going to ask that exact same question because that's what I did four years ago. I sense that there are a lot of people in this room that are starting their network automation journey. So I will ask this question. How many of you are, are currently building tools for yourself? Only for yourself, you're only doing it for yourself. You're the only user of the tool. Okay, cool. How many of you are building tools or automations that are used by other people in your network engineering team? That's really cool. 
Uh, okay, now how many of you are building tools that are used outside of the network engineering team, like what I'm showing here, this kind of use case? Okay. Now, the reason why I ask those things is because um, when you start going down these, the, the journey of being in network automation, the, the level of hardness, you know, how hard it becomes, or what level of ownership in terms of am I a software developer, or am I a programmer, or am I a scripter? You know, I don't really care about these labels, but the moment that you start building software for other people to use that isn't yourself, the, the expectation of reliability and support goes through the roof. Right? That Slack app, if people at ballparks are now depending on it, it's, it's mission critical to them. So it's, it's software to them, and it has to be as if it were bought software. Versus if I just made a little tool that parsed out a CSV file and I'm the only user, I don't really care if it crashes in front of me because I can, I can fix it. So when we talk about how much time and energy you put into a process, I always think about are you building this for somebody else or are you building it for yourself? And then when you're using or building libraries, this is what I look at. You know, how good are the libraries or how good is the community around that, that technology? Uh, Netbox is obviously a great example of this. You know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's amazing. There's a great docs, it's a great tool, there's a great community. You can trust that, right? With the Slack uh, system, if you're going to attempt to write this type of software, what I've learned is that their API is fantastic. Their documentation is amazing. And I can go on a Slack channel for help, and they will give me help. It's, they're very, very good. So if you wanted to try to do this, there's a great support uh, community around it. Um, I did learn that the UI widgets are constrained for your mobile experience. And what I mean by that is you only get so many characters across. So when you're looking at the, the core descriptions, you get 24 characters. That's it. So, you know, there are things like that. And they're not, I mean, they are documented, but you don't really see them until you're like, why, am I, why is this text being clipped off? Um, not all of the widgets are mix and match. For example, if I had a dialog box, I, I don't have all the capabilities that I have with the interactive messaging stuff. Like, I can't do colors and I can't have pretty pictures everywhere. It's just very limited. The dialog box mechanism is very limited. Um, having role-based access control was important to us. We wanted certain people to do certain things and other people not to be able to do certain things. You can accomplish that, but it doesn't come for free. So this app runs in a channel. The people who are in that channel get to run this app. We have another channel, there's another app. You know, we're doing kind of channel-based rollback. You can get really complicated. Um, so, you know, you, you know, quote, if you're a programmer, you can do anything, but you don't get R back for free. I'll just put it to you that way. Um, the other thing that's important to me is how quickly can I go from, you know, aha, I want to do this thing to I'm actually developing and running code and, and I have a hello world. Um, as I said, the, the Slack cloud system has to talk to a public API, a publicly available API. Uh, Slack recommends this, this tool called Ngrok. Has anybody heard of Ngrok? I didn't know about it either. It's really dope. Uh, basically, you run this program on your laptop and you say, hey, make HTTP, you know, on this port. Uh, accessible, it gives you a URL, which is like, you know, ngrok.io slash some whatever, and that is now plumbed to your laptop. I don't know if the security people would really appreciate that, but it's great, it works. Uh, so I have essentially the ability to have Slack, you know, cloud talk to my laptop, and when I don't, I just kill it and it's gone. So um, if you ever wanted to try doing, you know, dev test on your laptop, which we've talked about uh, here, um, you can do that with Ngrok. There are probably other ways, but Ngrok is super easy. Uh, the other thing that is really, really important to, to keep in mind when you're doing this is that because your Slack bot accesses your back of house systems, you know, Netbox, your network, there are access tokens and secrets that must be managed. Like, that has to happen because your Netbox has to have access to those things. Uh, and your application is going to be on the net because it's publicly you know, addressable. So how you handle your secrets and tokens is extraordinarily important. Um, just recently in the news, uh, you know, GitHub was, I don't, I don't think GitHub was hacked, but a lot of people tend to store their passwords and tokens in GitHub. They accidentally check it in, they don't think it's very important. Please don't do that. Um, don't do that. Uh, even if you're using a private GitHub, which we are, don't do that. Uh, there are ways to encode or encrypt secrets automatically with GitHub. There's like 
Git secret or Git crypt that do this automatically for you, please take the five minutes and set that up. You know, don't, don't put any of your secrets in the clear. Um, if you use something like Vault or even like Netbox as a source of truth for your secrets, you know, just do something, but don't put your secrets in the clear. Uh, I have one minute for Q&A. Uh, and I'm, obviously I'll be happy to talk uh, at lunch uh, or anytime you want to find me. All of the code that, there's a library that I built that basically is a, you know, PyEZ style framework because, you know, I'm that guy. Um, it is in GitHub under Jeremy Shulman, so if you want to try to write a, uh, uh, a Slack kind of look and feel like this, I tried to make it easy to, to do so you're not writing all this low-level code. Um, it's a work in progress, I'll be honest, you know, but I'm using it in production, so if anybody is interested, I'm happy to show you any, any code, talk about it, it's out there. Thank you.